Beloved, as we approach this weekend, one of the readings is Psalm 51, when David seeks the mercy and the forgiveness of God after not only having committed adultery with Bathsheba, but after being guilty of murder for putting her husband in the line of immediate fighting in war. And he is confronted by Nathan the prophet, and in the process, he cries out to God. We know these words very well. However, the appropriateness of them is so significant for our daily life. And it's significant for the day in which we live because there are so many things that seem to fly in the face of what David is actually revealing as it relates to the Christ-shaped life that are often taken for granted and often are used as a justification for sin, which is not what David is doing here. In a day when there's so much compromise and where we seem to have lost a sense of the fear of God in the church, David cries out, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, in your great compassion. Blot out my offenses. Wash me thorough and through and through from wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for the truth deep within me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin and I shall be pure. Wash me and I shall indeed be clean. Make me hear of joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Beloved, there are so many times in our life where we think that the way to quote-unquote get right with God is to look at where we have fallen short from those things that he requires. Christianity is not a moralism. It's not a set of do's and don'ts whereby we look at a standard, whether it be the Ten Commandments or whatever, and say, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, because you can't keep the law by yourself in your own strength. Christ, the fulfillment of the law, has to live that life through you. However, One of the things that I think we need to realize that has almost been lost in popular Christianity is the depth of awareness of convictional experience. When David cries out, create in me a clean heart, oh my God, he's not just looking at the law of Moses. He has not only been confronted by Nathan the prophet when Nathan says, you are the man, and you're guilty. He has a profound encounter equal to the encounter of Isaiah when he sees the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe fills the temple. And Isaiah says, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. I'm radically deconstructed in the presence of the one who is totally other, in the presence of the theophanic glory of the one who dwells in inapproachable light. Beloved, the Holy Spirit wants to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The late James E. Loader, Princeton professor, uh, who wrote a book called The Transforming Moment on Convictional Experience, I believe, has something to say to us, though he's dead, yet he still speaks, that the transforming moments of conviction by the Spirit when we are conquered by Christ, when we are conquered by the lover of our soul, to realize how 
utterly other he is, so that when we with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror his glory are undone, we are then changed into that same image and likeness. I fear we have become too familiar with Jesus and we've reduced him to being our BFF and have failed to realize that he is the Lord of glory. And rather than try to rationalize that out, what we need is to have fresh encounters with the self-revealing God who, as Jesus said, wants to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, mind you, there are those that claim that conviction only happens at the point of conversion and never happens again. I'm going to suggest to you that the prayer, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me, is something that the early church fathers and mothers and many throughout church history have prayed every single day in the awesome awareness of the presence of the Lord of glory, of how totally other he is, totally holy he is, and how totally unlike him we are, and how much we need his forgiveness and need his mercy. It's one of my favorite psalms, precisely because it, it invites me to come into the presence of the one who is totally holy, holy, holy. And that in the presence of the Holy One, a deep conviction is formed that he is God and I am simply a human being called to bear his image and likeness and yet so miserably fall short of that, that even though I am saved by grace, yet I need the ongoing self-revealing God to make himself known to me in all that I can handle of his glory so that I can be formed and shaped into his image and into his likeness, to live the cruciform life, the cross-shaped life, the life that Paul says to the church at Corinth, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The prayer created me a clean heart didn't come because David sat and looked at the Decalogue, the Ten Laws of Moses, and said, I've committed adultery, I've committed murder. He was guilty and should have been sentenced to death. And yet he knew something about the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. He had had encounters with the Holy One. You look at all the Psalms of David and you discover that the pre-incarnate Son of God on many occasions had profoundly revealed himself to David so that David would prophesy about Messiah as if in the first person. He would partake of the sufferings of Messiah in his writings. So he knew full well there was coming a Messiah that he saw prefigured and like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, like Moses, like Abraham. He saw that day. He sensed that day. He made careful search and inquiry who to the manner and times that the spirit of Christ within him was indicating the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. James Loder tells us that convictional experiences are epiphanies. They're moments that are arranged by God to bring us into a deeper and abiding union and communion with himself by Christ through the Avon Avenue of the Holy Spirit so that we're brought into the divine life, we're brought into the divine communion of love. We all need God's mercy. We all need his forgiveness. And the moment we believe conviction and condemnation are the same thing, we have just adulterated the word of God. There is no condemnation, and that speaks of that which would condemn us to death as a result of the law of Moses. There is no condemnation, but there is conviction, and there is forgiveness with God that he might be feared. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the only appropriate response 
to a revelation of the glory of the one who brings us into transforming glory from glory to glory and from faith to faith is ongoing continual repentance repentance and faith are a lifestyle not a one-time event create in us lord a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us don't take your Holy Spirit from us, but renew a right spirit within us. Sunday's going to be a great day in the house. I want to encourage you to bring someone with you as we break bread together, as we hear the word of the Lord together, as we move forward in this season in faith. God is up to something good. See you Sunday.